Good morning, my Freunde, and welcome to a semi-regular little fun piece where we look back none too seriously at the top 40 charts from my humble hometown from a corresponding week in a random year and rate the great and slate the unfortunate. The first selection is the groovy and furthermore swinging sounds of the Colour Radio 4IP Top 40 from the week ending 5th of January 1968. At number 10 we had a band from Adelaide. So much good Australian rock came out of Adelaide in the late 60s, early 70s. Most notably one of the seeds of the Little River Band, a group called Alison Gross, who later became Mississippi, and a certain Bon Scott, who found a modicum of fame in a fashionably early death some years later. The band we're looking at today is The Vibrance, with their slightly hysterical cover of The Platter's Oldie My Prayer. A two-hit wonder, they had previously charted with the cover of the four tops Something About You, a much better choice of song. Number 10 was as high as the Vibrance got locally, although they did make number 5 nationally. After this hit, they went back to Adelaide, where they presumably played the round of bingo halls, high school dances and local Saturday morning TV, before they disappeared circa 1971. Number 9, dropping down the charts after three weeks at number 1, is The Last Waltz by Engelbert Humperdinck, the biggest selling single in Australia for 1967. For those who haven't had the pleasure, if pop singers were premium priced tool watchers, Tom Jones would be the Amiga Seamaster of Vegas Glitz in a pop singer and The Hump was a $73 knockoff with the Chinese movement that you get from Wish.com. This making number one, and remember in England he kept Penny Lane by the Beatles off the top spot with Release Me, was ample proof that Granny still bought records in vast numbers in the late 1960s. Number eight was another Adelaide band, The Twilights with Kathy Come Home, who featured future LRB lead singer Glenn Shorrock and Terry Britton, a chap who went on to write Devil Woman for Cliff Richard, all of Christy Allen's hits, What's Love Got To Do With It by Tina Turner and Circus for Lenny Kravitz. Despite its title, the song had nothing to do with Ken Loach's harrowing 1966 teleplay and is instead a rather cheery but already dated slab of psychedelia bordering on bubblegum pop, the kind of record the Hollies would have excelled at even if it would have pissed off Graham Nash no end. Number 7 of the second best band ever from Newport, Rhode Island, The Cowsells, with The Rain, The Park and Other Things. Judging by the comments on their music around YouTube, people seem genuinely fond of The Cowsells. They had three national top five hits in Australia, so how is it that this record, so similar in genre and intent to Kathy Come Home, can come off to me as at least cloying and dull, whereas its previous is a pleasant pop innocuity? It may have to do with the relative energy levels of the songs. Kathy is much livelier than The Rain. Still, having risen to the giddy heights of number four, this record was now beginning the long but inevitable transition to AM Gold playlists forevermore. Number six is an absolute banger from Morrissey's sweetheart Sandy Shaw, You've Not Changed. Second only to the imperious Dusty Springfield among 60s pop divas, Shaw was, like Dusty, a difficult, and I'm making the little air inverted commas as I say that, and a determined woman who made her way through the industry by knowing a great song and working to her strengths and away from her limitations. Up from number 13 the previous week, this was as good as it got for this record, which seems to have disappeared from local oldies playlists, becoming a bit of a forgotten hit. A few fun facts before we hit the top five. The two most significant new entries this week were the Beach Boys, who jumped in at number 40 with Wild Honey, and proving it wasn't all grannies buying the records this week, noted long-haired volume merchants the Vanilla Fudge plopped You Keep Me Hanging On at number 36. The biggest hits still on the charts and falling out of the top 10 were Massachusetts by the Bee Gees, which spent four weeks atop the charts, and Ichiku Park by the Small Faces, which was at the pinnacle for two weeks. Ichiku Park was also the longest standing member of the top 40, having adorned the charts for 16 weeks, a record matched somewhat dismally by The Last Waltz. Number five was the fast rising daydream believer by the Monkees. A thorny proposition to assess because history has tainted the Monkees as a band that represented everything fake and corporate about rock music and was some kind of beginning of some kind of end. 
Of course, any subjective truth will balance that with the fact that, given them the right songs, they were experienced and talented musicians who came from diverse backgrounds, yet were empathetic enough to one another's strengths and weaknesses to be able to make some seamless and timeless pop. So the question really is, was Daydream Believer the right song? Well, the good burgers of my sleepy river city certainly thought so, as did the rest of the world, which sent it to number one everywhere. But I'm, from this standpoint, less convinced. To my mind of thinking, it's not a record of its time, like Pleasant Valley Sunday, or one bullheadedly against its time, like their proto-bubblegum singles of 1966. It has a sweet tune and a hook, but the performance is unconvincing and the lyrics are facile at best. Still, the punters liked it. New Zealander Maria Dallas went all the way to Nashville to cut her number four hit Ambush. It's certainly a lively country rocker, but Dallas's voice, thick with a fake nasal American accent and a range of about three notes and the fact that she barely seems to pause to take breath between them, makes this a curiosity more than it was a keeper. At number three, we had a one-time number one, The Two of Us by Jackie Trent and Tony Hatch, a dull, middle-of-the-road confection with a disconcerting middle eight that appears to be appropriated from a nightclub striptease acts playlist. Number two, oh dear. Johnny Farnham was one of the true legends of Australian music. Not only is he non-pareil as a song stylist in these parts, people have had better voices, but Farnham has a superb ear for a song and making it his own, and he has proven it countless times over 50 years or more. He's also universally known as one of the friendliest and most humble men in the business. But that superb ear was pitifully underdeveloped when he recorded his debut single, Sadie the Cleaning Lady. I mean, awful as it is, it did sell 180,000 copies and became the biggest selling single by an Australian artist to that point. It's frankly though a horrid novelty record and an artifact that can only be truly appreciated or need even be approached by those who lived through it. Number one. The Beatles knocked Snoopy's Christmas off the top of the peg, which then promptly plummeted to number 13, with Hello Goodbye. Oddly for a record that spent seven weeks atop the UK chart, which equaled She Loves You's record, it was deposed the very next week by Sadie. It's not a song that immediately comes to mind when you think of the best Beatles tracks, even the best Beatles singles, although the B-side on the walrus raises the bar a little, but we bought pretty much anything by the beloved Shaghead Mop Tops and we bought enough of this to get it over to the toppermost of the poppermost for a solitary week. And that brings us to the end of the week. A few hits, a few misses and a handful of oddities and curiosities. Using my super secret assessment algorithm, I calculate this week's top 10 to have a normalized score of 4.2 out of 10. What do you think? Any particular favorites of yours in the weekly top 10? Any I've been too harsh on with my assessments or any that deserve an even heavier serving of opprobrium? Do let me know. But until the next time we meet together in good company or until the nasty YouTube please shut the channel down, May your Bojambo forever remain righteous. Thank <laughs> you.